everyone. Today is Thursday, March 16th, 2023, and this is the week in charts. I'm just going to thank all you guys and girls for attending. I know I'm doing a poor job of getting the word out there. <laughs> Today was another one of those days where that happened. Uh, if you ever want to watch these live, just go to DaveLearner.com slash webinar. If you look down below on YouTube, if you're watching this as a recording, the link will be down there. We'd love to have you. Register once and you register for all. Unless I muck something up. Or what are we talking about? Well, obviously, current market initiative. I'll have a lot to say about that. He tried to say your questions on trading your favorite stock and crypto picks. If you don't mind, just ask about those one at a time and then hit carriage return. Wait until the we get to the live charts, though, on those. But feel free to ask any other questions you may have or if something doesn't make sense. Feel free to ask. I put out some requests for shows or what to cover the show. One of them was put options as a substitute for stock. And then based on one of the post things, there was a question on a transitional setup. And I want to flesh that out. At the last minute, I decided to do another intraday uh, trading brief update. Is it worth it? I don't know. I'm still working through it. But uh, it seems like I am making a little progress here and there, although I was still at a drawdown, which doesn't sound like progress. It's like I know what to do. I just need to do it. <laughs> Sounds like trading in general, doesn't it? I want to talk a little bit about timing with the VIX, follow up with some of the stuff I said earlier this week at the stock charts show. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you lose money trading or as I'll summing up all predictions or about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. All right. The, the VIX only matters when it matters. And I'll have some follow up thoughts on this in a few minutes. But when the market starts getting kind of crazy, like it is now, I think it's important to pay attention to what's happening in the VIX. Now, I've showed this slide before. I've added a few things to it over the last year or so. And this is the close, the open, the high, and the low. All the research originally was based on a closing VIX, plus or minus 10% above the 10-day simple moving average. And that's simply just measuring the distance from the 10-day simple moving average. And just a little bit of background real quick. Years ago, shit, I think it's 35 years or 30 years. <laughs> I'm getting so damn old. I worked with Larry Connors. I did some consulting with him. And I was doing programming and system development. And he really digged the fact that he actually called me a gym because I could program and understood markets. And and I know he's worked with programmers before and he, he, he has to explain the markets to him and everything else. So I'd kind of take the ball and run with it. And he said the VIX reverts to his mean and he would have me test a few systems. And I started coming up with a whole bunch on my own, especially those related to the 10 day simple moving average. And he said that I was a gem because I could do both the programming and understood markets. So that was very flattering. And uh, he gave me a really uh, a shot in my arm early in my career, which was a, uh, very nice of him, and I'm grateful for that. Anyway, that's the chart that I use when I do my quick analysis. And this is the S&P 500 in the background. I've come up with some other charts to show you here in just one second, which are kind of based on this or are based on this. As you can see, the VIX can be a little cyclical in nature. And that's one thing I'll flesh out in one second. You'll, so, you'll see people draw head and shoulders bottoms on VIXs and stuff like that or VIX. And it simply doesn't work that way. It's it's measurement of volatility. And volatility tends to expand and contract. And some of the things I said earlier this week and before, and some of the stuff I learned from Connor years ago, it does tend to overshoot itself at times. Let's see if I can adjust this a little bit. So if it's kind of low and it reverts back to the mean, sometimes it shoots through the mean. And there's a lot of other little nuances and stuff, and I'll try to flesh out as many of those as possible. So what I did with, in the stock chart show is I took the ACP platform, and I was able to, and I'll, I'll give you these charts in just one second, so you don't have to go through the trouble of recreating them. But I have the VIX plotted as invisible in the background, and then I have the S&P plotted as the line chart up above. And the point I was making is that when you get more than 10% away, stretched away from that moving average, the VIX tends to revert back to its mean, and then the market tends to reverse. 
Now, I'll probably flesh this out in a few seconds, but just in case I forget or get sidetracked, my VIX systems, as were Larry's, were multi-day systems. And I, I dusted them off a while back, I think during the pan, before the pandemic or whatever, and they absolutely printed money. But when you go into the pandemic, the wheels kind of came off the bus a little bit. And that's because you'll get a market that stretch and just keeps on running. Now, one thing I've been doing in more recent times is use them to help me time the intraday stuff. So if I know the VIX is stretched, then I'm just waiting for that market to start to reverse and look to play that intraday trend. So as a general statement, when you're 10% or more away from the 10-day simple moving average, and this is using a close of the VIX, okay, the closing price or the current price if you look at it intraday. And then also, as I showed earlier, I have been looking at the open, high, low, and close and working with that too. And that's really interesting, especially when you get a spike up to like 50% or something like, or so like we saw recently. Anyway, above 10% or 10% or more below, there tends to be complacency. So the VIX is measuring both at the money puts and calls. And a lot of people get this confused, but it's both puts and calls. And what's what happens is when the market begins to kind of become uncertain and banks start failing, uh, you know, Kramer recommends a bank and it fails over the next three weeks. I got to be careful not to be shot on Friday. I just, I, on every trade, I was listening to a little Douglas earlier and it's like, you know, you got to manage your expectations. Every trade could turn into a loss. He just goes out there and screams about a stock. Like it's just going to go up, 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 up. And he sucks in all these stupid people who are stupid enough to think that just because he's on TV, he's um, some grand poobah. I better watch it. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Uh, here are some links here where you could uh, you could pick up the charts, and I have some more links further down in the presentation. But in general, you could see when it gets to an extreme, and I'll, I'll walk you through this in a little bit more detail, just one second. When it gets to the extreme up or down, the market tends to reverse, and you could see big sell-offs come when the market becomes complacent. And rallies tend to occur after the after you have a bit of a panic. And again, I'll walk you through these in just one second. And you can see we had that recent peak here. Now, right before I went live, I got to thinking it would probably look better as a histogram. And by the way, these links will be placed below on Facebook. I need to put a link out so where you guys can download these slides too. I'll work on that. Anyway, these links will be placed below the video in the comment section if you wanted to recreate these charts yourself without any trouble. You would need the ACP platform though, just FYI on that. I don't get any compensation on that. I just get, I guess, exposure from uh, doing a show for those guys. Anyway, long story endless, if you look at this point here, earlier this year, you could see that it looked like happy days were here. Again, the market was headed higher. But then you could see that we had that major reversal. Now, here's the thing. Just because the VIX is stretched, do not rush out and buy stocks or sell stocks, whatever the case may be. Sometimes it takes, it has a little lag to it, but just know that the clock is ticking. And it's one more little tool you could use to help in your market timing, especially if you're doing something on an intraday basis. So you can see it took a day, but then it sold off pretty darn hard. Down here, the market became complacent. And then what happened? Well, the market began to resume its sell off. Another case here where the market became complacent, it actually went up for one more day. The following day, it dropped even further. And then you can see the market then began to implode. Right here, you could see the market was in a bit of a panic and the market actually continued lower, but then notice it had a little bit of a pop. But at this juncture, you also notice that we are in a bit of a shorter term, at least downtrend, and you just didn't get a whole lot out of that stretched conditions. Now, in more recent times, we got stretched away to the upside, which means a bit of a panic. Day one, day two, and then it just kind of went nuts in the panic, like the whole world's going to end. And and I saw VIX readings 
on the high of 50%. And that's something that I'm going to work on and flesh out over time. But that was kind of pretty cool to see that that panicky type of VIX happening, especially when you're mostly out of the market. I think I got stopped out of my last long a couple of days ago. And then I triggered into a new one today. I'll talk about that one in one second. But you can see the market has had a pretty decent rally since. Yeah, ATAT. ATAT, uh, good uh, good guess. I got stopped out of ATAT a couple of days ago. And then I actually triggered in you too, huh, Jeff? Well, good. Congratulations. So long. Thanks for all the fish. It wasn't a tr fantastic trade. But after all was said and done, it was profitable. And, you know, in this game, anytime you get a profitable trade, you need to feel good about yourself, especially when you, when you held it for as long as we did and you followed all the rules, then you need to be happy about that. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because I covered it earlier this week. If you go to my website, davelander.com, you can watch the video there. But just real quick, it's a hypothetical act of money, puts and calls, okay, price, which looks out 30 days. So tomorrow it's going to look out 30 days. And then Monday it's going to look out 30 days. And then it's going to be a hypothetical price. Now, the, the, the formula is about that big. And I suppose if I spent a little time, I could probably figure out what it is, but why would I? Uh, you know, I could flip a light and get, uh, I could flip a switch, that is, and get long day, long week, <laughs> long year. I could flip a switch and get electricity, right, without knowing a whole lot about it. So just know that it measures fear and complacency. Now, again, it only matters when it matters. Use a weight of evidence approach. Don't necessarily fight the trend if you got a VIX signal, but use it as a bit of an aha. We're probably getting close to a reversal. And again, don't fight the trend. And you'll notice if you rewind back to that chart, once we had a little bit of a trend develop, like I showed earlier, the moves aren't that big. Those counter trend moves aren't that big. But then when you get like a washout move where you're seeing 50 and whatever it was percent intraday on the VIX and it's already stretched on a closing basis, 20% or whatever that was going back to that chart, then you know you're getting closer and closer to a bottom. You don't know if it's going to be the bottom, by the way, but you certainly can go in and especially when the VIX is stretched and you start to see the market you start to see the market develop a bit of a route, then you can say, okay, well, I've got that piece of the pie behind me, a little bit of wind in my sails, that might help me out a little bit. And if you're gonna take it like an intraday trade, you might wanna do that because you've got to, again, the VIX backing you. Now, you gotta be careful, obviously, if the market is severely overbought or oversold, but that's a lot of times that's where you get pretty decent signals. It goes a little bit against my trend following mantra, but it certainly doesn't go against technical analysis in general in that everybody's in a panic mode. And when the last person sells, last person freaks out, that's when the market turns right back up. Now, as I said earlier, this stuff prints money on a short term basis. However, if you get into a, a crazy mode like the pandemic or something crazy like, like the bank slide we just had or whatever, the market could get stretched really, really far. So be careful. Don't fight the trend until you begin to see a bit of a turn. Uh, the VIX futures and ETFs on the VIX futures, you could use them, but be careful. Like I'll trade SVXY and UVXY, but be careful because those are or futures or based on futures. And I forget how many derivatives it is. The VIX it's, itself is a derivative, so that's one. Futures are a derivative, so that's two. And an ETF is a derivative, so that's three. Somehow it was coming up with four, but if I think about it, I could probably get a fourth one in there. But it's at least three derivatives, and it's really, a uh, whatever you're using futures, things get complex fast. You have Contango, where, the, where there, there's a decay built into the market. And you got to be careful of all those things, especially if you get a hold more than one day. I usually only try to trade the VIX itself intraday. As I said earlier, don't 
try to use standard technical analysis. It's a measurement of volatility. And there might be certain things that certain aspects that work like reversion to the mean, but it's more volatility based type of analysis as opposed to, oh, I got a cup in the hand or a bow tie or whatever. No, that don't don't use that stuff because that's not how it works. As I said earlier, it does tend to overshoot itself. VIX is, is asymmetrical. Volatility is asymmetrical. The panic tends to be on the upside. And, and the bottom little indicator on that first chart I showed is what percentage move the VIX made on an intraday basis relative to its average true range. And some of those moves are like 500 to 600% like when you get in something like the uh, a panic during the pandemic or something like that. So it's asymmetrical and, and I'd much rather be long volatility than short volatility, although I'll do whatever the market calls for. But the asymmetry, the asymmetry, if that's the correct word, is on the upside. And I've done VIX videos. And if you go to my YouTube channel, which is go to YouTube and then it's at Dave Landry, you'll you can get all these videos. Just real quick, this is something I covered a stock chart show. We almost had a buy signal four or five weeks ago in the TFM 10% system. We had two bars of Landry light on a weekly basis above the 50 week moving average. So that's step one. Step two is a close within 10% of the 50 week high and we close below that green line, which I call the buy line. And then you can see we've mostly imploded since. All right, any questions on anything so far? We'll go ahead and shift gears. Okay, so the question was, what do you think about a first thrust in R-E-L-Y? Well, first thrust is a pattern that comes off of major lows. It's a transitional pattern. So you want to see a major high or a major low before looking to trade a transitional pattern. Now, it might be some other pattern, but if we're talking about transitional patterns, that's what you're looking for, okay? So you can see back in May, technically it was a first thrust, although the pattern just failed. It came right back in. Never did. It looks like it didn't trigger. So you may have dodged a bull if you're looking at that, but this last little lay higher, I would treat that more like a pullback and I really don't like it that much. Maybe if it pulls back a little further, whatever, it might be worth a shot, but for now, I'm not too excited about it. So back here off of major lows, that would be a first thrust, but not this last push higher. So if we go back to the transitional segment of trading full circle, by the way, if you're a gold member, you do get this course for free eventually, you have enough stuff to keep you busy a long time though before you get to this. In fact, because I've, had, I've been asked thousands of questions over the years, when I put together the members area, questions like what's a first thrust and how do you trade a first thrust, et cetera, it's all in there. And I did that to so I could send people and say, okay, go look over there. So this stuff I'm covering now has been covered in the trading full circle. It's also been covered quite a bit in the members area of the website. Now, the first step is you want a major, major, major low. Ideally, for stocks, an all-time low is fantastic. For an index, obviously, and hopefully, we won't ever have an all-time low again, but you certainly want like a multi-year low or an all-time high. So if you get an all-time high, keep an eye out for the occasional bow tie or whatever off of that all time high. And then you gotta start thinking about pulling in your horns a little bit when that happens. But you want a sharp thrust from lows. And then all you need for this pattern is a one bar pullback, a lower low and a lower high. We're not really looking for a deep pullback because this is the first signs of a correction after the market begins to shoot up from lows. And not enough time to get into all the details of it tonight, but the, the bottom line is people who are waiting for a deeper pullback will be left behind if the market takes off without them, okay? So you get a little tiny little one-bar pullback. I'm willing to get in right on that. 
high of the bar. Now, if it's an established trend, I tend to like much more deeper pullbacks. Unless we get into a rip roar and bull market, then I might trade what's considered a bull flag or something, a shallow type of pullback. But anyway, as usual, you want to wait for an entry for the market to trade above that pullback high. Now, the crypto stocks recently had a bunch of transitional type of patterns because crypto took off for a while. And crypto, as I've been saying lately, goes from 1999 to 2000 and then back again. I shorted a bunch of them a couple of days ago and I just came in this morning and started covering just because they, they stopped going down. But anyway, I just grabbed one of them off the list. Hunt made an all-time low or certainly a multi-year low. I forget if it was all-time, but it was a multi-year low. And you could see it just went kind of straight up from the lows. Now, it was also a bow tie. So sometimes you'll get a couple of these patterns come together. A bow tie is just a defined first thrust or whatever you want to call it. But it's a defined pattern where you can actually scan for them, obviously. And I think, um, in fact, I know stock charts just added proper order to their scanner and Landry Light too. So if you wanted to scan for Landry Light pullbacks and bow ties, I was helping somebody work on that a couple of weeks ago. And then ironically, two days later, they added my plugin to the scanner, which is pretty cool. And I'll I'll show you that if if you want to just see that, go back two episodes of Trading Simplified. If you're if you're a, a free member of my website, you could get those on the back end of the website. If you're a paid member, you have access to all that stuff. Anyway, bow tie was there, also a first thrust. Sometimes you'll have one setup meet criteria or one pattern meet the criteria for more than one setup. And we had the lower low and the lower high. Now, to the trained eye, you might look back here and say, well, it's a little overhead supply, Dave. Yeah, I know that. It, it had some issues. But the point I was trying to make here is that it is a first thrust, it is a bow tie. And you can see it took off out of the pattern. And they had a pretty damn good run, but then unfortunately it came back in. And I think we played that second thrust and it didn't work out for us, unfortunately. It, spell the sign of the SH, happens. So the bottom line is if you're going to trade a transitional setup, it's not like coming out of a base. That might be a different pattern, maybe a first pullback after base breakout or first pullback after base breakdown. That's not a bow tie or that's not a first thrust, okay? A first thrust or a bow tie is something coming off of major, major lows and major, major highs. Okay, one question I was asked today, I'm curious about shorting using options. Now, I did cover this quite a bit, and there's two links that I'm going to put down below on YouTube. And if you're watching this on YouTube, they should be there. One is to the members area where you have to be a member. And the other is a week of charts that I did probably three or four years ago on options. So I'll make those available for you. The second one, at least, for free. The first one, you have to be a member. The reason I call it a can of worms with options is because if you know what you're doing, you probably will roll your eyes at what I'm saying, as I often say. If you don't know what you're doing, then I might just confuse you. <laughs> so it's a can of worms. And the other thing about options too, as I often preach, is the only thing you have to do to trade options is get price right. In other words, the trend right. The trend has to continue. You have to get time right. And then you also have to sometimes Get the volatility right too so if you can get time price and volatility right then you can trade options i as i've said quite a bit i worked for a hedge fund for about 14 years and i did the technical analysis and i didn't actually do the options trading or anything but a little bit of that option stuff wore off on me through osmosis but it was always kind of frustrating or interesting i should say when i was asked the question i left out magnitude too so I would do my technical analysis and say, okay, well, where's the bond market headed? Well, it looks like it's headed up. Okay, well, how far is it going to go? I was like, I don't know. I'm a trend follower, but I don't know, five points at least, I would think. It looks like it's headed up. And the next question would be, well, when is it going to get there? So it was a very hard and challenging job 
but my the person who hired me was very forgiving and one time i think i asked him like why are you forgiving <laughs> you know and he said well he said the guy before you he just couldn't make a decision he, and and basically he said to me that in so many words that that i'm often wrong but i'm never in doubt and i think that's the secret to trading and then try to be wrong less and less and less but be willing to commit to your analysis and your methodology and follow it good and bad now one thing i like to do with options and i'm not going to get into option models other than i don't use them and i don't really see a use for them okay if you're an engineering type then knock yourself out if you're not i would not even worry about models because Everybody brother has the model, okay? So what you could do is use your superior stock selection and trading knowledge and trend knowledge to decide whether or not the option is worth it. And the easiest thing to do when it comes to options is think in terms of at expiration, okay? So at expiration, and we're talking about puts here, if the stock is at 91 and your option is 90, okay, you're only going to get paid on that option if it's below 90. If it's 89 at expiration, how much is it worth? One point. If it's 88, how much is it worth? Two points, okay? So think in terms of at expiration and then work backwards from there, okay? For example, and I'm going to show you an options trade a call position I put on earlier today. For S and G's, a pizza party type of trade. But work backwards from expiration. So, okay, I've got one week left. The stock price is 95. Okay, that's where it's currently trading. I'm looking at the 90 puts at one point, and that sounds a little cheap, but let's assume you can get the 90 puts for one point. Can the stock move at least six points? Okay, what's 95 minus six? 89. Okay, to go one point in the money so that i would at least break even at, at expiration and obviously your predictions would would hopefully have you several points in the money to make that option worthwhile and again i'm going to walk you through an sng example in a minute gamma type of play which is a little bit on the dangerous side but i risked a whopping 25 dollars, and i think it's gonna be fun to see how that shakes out now the higher the strike remember we're talking about puts okay the less extrinsic value you're going to have but the more money you'll have to risk that that'll make a lot more sense in a minute so again we're talking about puts so let's say to make it easy we have a strike price of 90 and the stock is trading at 90 okay so those would be at the money puts okay now they have zero intrinsic value. If the market was at 89, they would be worth one point. 90 minus 89 is one point, okay? So an at the money option, if the stock is exactly at 90, the premium you have to pay for that option is 100% fluff, fluff, okay? Or extrinsic value, I call it fluff. So you're paying for that right for that option, okay, a right but not obligation to sell that stock at 90, sometimes between now and expiration. If it drops below 90, you could just sell the option. You don't have to exercise the option. You could sell the option and profit on it, hopefully. Now, we're talking about options as a substitution for stock so the further you go in the money the more intrinsic value the stock will have so in this case if you took the cost of the option let's say it's twelve dollars okay and you subtract ten dollars because it's worth ten dollars it's ten points in the money you have the right to sell the stock at 100, the stock is at 90, that's worth $10, okay? A little bit easier to understand on the call side to realize this, but the question being asked is how do you use them 
as a substitute for shorting. So as you go closer to the money, you have less intrinsic and you have more fluff or extrinsic in the premium. Now, just an FYI, if you're trying to, let's say you want to short 100 shares of this stock. Well, if you short 100 shares at, let's say 90, okay, your position acts like a delta of 100 or technically minus 100, but let's not make it too confusing. But for every $1 the position moves in your favor, how much money do you make on 100 shares? You make $100, okay? The at the money options, a little confusing, just take it at face value though. If the market's trading at 90, then it, they have a delta of 50, okay? So it's gonna act like 50 shares of stock. Now, once it starts moving further into money, then that delta is gonna approach 100. So if you are trying to substitute for stock, you need to, I always start at the money when I'm doing this and maybe even look a little bit out of the money. But if you want a true substitution for the stock, you want it to trade like a hundred shares short, then you gotta go a little bit deeper into the money. Now, if you are, let's say 10 points out the money, okay? Stocks at 90, you're buying 80 options. Means you have the right to sell the stock at 80. Well, it's at 90 now. So that's not worth anything because the stock is 10 points higher. So the delta is, is very little on those options. So if it, let's say stocks at 90, let's say it drops one point, that option might go up 10 cents or 20 cents, okay? Delta of whatever that is. Delta of 10 or 20, I guess. Now, any option below 90 is all fluff or all extrinsic. If somebody wants to sell you this 80 option for a dollar, okay, it's not worth anything at expiration. So, again, go to expiration and then work backwards and ask yourself, okay, they're going to sell me this option for $1, which will cost me $100 because it's 100 shares. So it's priced in just like a stock would be priced, right? So $1 stock, you buy 100 shares, how much money comes out of your account? $100. So if you have a $80 stock and it's priced for $1, the option that is, it's $100. So hopefully that makes sense. But the, the pricing is all the same, no matter what the price of the stock is, Whatever the price is, multiply that times 100 because that gives you the right for 100 shares, but not the obligation. Now, European options work differently, and I'm not going to Europe anytime soon, so I'm not worried about that. <laughs> but American options work much differently. And most of the options are sold before expiration. Now, I do occasionally exercise. I exercised options last Friday. If it's real, if it's close to close to the close, and I feel like the price I'm getting for my in the money option isn't worth it, or if there's a big stupid spread or whatever, I'll just exercise and then dump the shares. Now that's a, another conversation altogether. Probably shouldn't have mentioned that, but rarely, most options never see ex see uh, or exercise. Now as you go deeper into the money, your delta is gonna approach 100, and the fluff is gonna come off, okay? So any option at the money or below for a put is 100% premium. And so, you know, again, I'm thinking to myself, everybody here, their eyes are probably glazing over. <laughs> but if you're, uh, if you're don't understand options, if you understand options, your eyes are glazing over. If you don't understand, it'll be like, what the hell is he talking about? But the further you get into money, the more the option is going to cost because it's worth more, okay? But the less premium is going to come off. Now, 
anything below the strike price for a put or above the strike price for a call is going to be cheaper from a money outlay standpoint, but it's less likely to pay off. So the further you go out of the money, the more of a gamble it's going to be. If the at the money options seem kind of reasonable to you, so let's say the at the money, I'll just throw a number out, are trading at two, $2, okay? And it's at 90 and you're thinking, you know what? $2, that's $200, I can live with that as opposed to buying those 100 options, which are like $1,000 and change. So it's like $200 or $1,000, but that $200 option, the stock is gonna have to move two points at expiration or by expiration, right? For that to be two points in the money to get paid off. Now there's a little fluff and volatility and all that is gonna vary greatly in between. And that's where limit orders can kind of help you out on those big crazy spikes Somebody needs to cover no matter what the price or whatever. You got a stupid limit order out there to cover uh, to get rid of somebody you position, then it might get taken out. But as a general wrap your head around things, always think in terms of at expiration or by expiration at least. So hey, I'm going to spend two dollars on these options because I really think the stock is going to implode, and I'm willing to piss away, so to speak, two dollars on that. Okay. If you're establishing maybe a little bit longer term position, then you might want to go a little deeper in the money to where some of that fluff comes off. You're putting up more money, but you still have limited losses. So let's say you had to put up, I don't know, $1,100 for those 100 options. And let's say you come in tomorrow and the stock skyrockets, okay, it gets bought out or whatever, it goes up 50 points. Well, you're not out $5,000, you're out $1,100 as opposed to $5,000. So you do, you can sleep a little bit at night because at least your gains or, I'm sorry, at least your losses are limited as opposed to outright shorting. Now, with outright shorting, when something really starts going to get you, you just cover, okay? And people say, well, you could lose unlimited money. Well, that's only if you're stupid enough not to cover. And believe me, your broker is going to cover your position for you eventually. If you run out of margin, you're out, okay? He'll, uh, he'll be kind enough to get you out. So if you go deeper into the money, it's going to cost you more money and they're more expensive but you're more likely to have the option not expire worthless. You still could lose a substantial amount of money, but the chances are of that option expiring worthless or greater than if you're going at the money or out of the money. Now, to each his own, I'm okay with paying a little bit of a premium to get a little closer to the money unless it's just ridiculous unless the options are ridiculously expensive then i go deeper and deeper in the money some people don't like paying the fluff and i get that and i'm sure if you're an engineer type and you're modeling it out you're like hey, i'm not paying 100 percent implied volatility or whatever the case may be but if you again in your head say can this option move far enough you know what's what's at expiration look like and can it move far enough to make it worthwhile at expiration then go for it okay that's my options pricing model there now this was a stock that triggered a week or so ago in the trading service this is one of my recommendations and i didn't take it because i applied a little bit of discretion and i told everybody look in some of you guys I know apply discretion too. And today it, it re-triggered because it took out this high. The original trigger was about right here. I think uh 4290 and it triggered this opening gap reversal, sort of opening gap reversal-ish. And I suggested using a little discretion in that case. But to mimic the service as best as possible, I took the trade today. And I thought the 45 options, which expire tomorrow at 3 p.m. Central Time, I thought those were pretty cheap. They were trading, they were asking five cents. It wasn't even a bid. 
So I started going in, you know, give me a hundred at a dollar, you know, S and G type of things. And, and, uh, okay. It'll give me uh, 50 at two cents, you know, and then give me whatever. And I just didn't want to pay a whole lot for them. So somehow I ended up with five at five cents. Okay. So remember a hundred times five will be $5 each total S and G trade. And I guess, I don't know how many I tried to get initially or whatever, when I got down to five, but I really don't want to pay. I wanted to pay less than five for them. And I wanted to get a lot of them off like 50 at least, but it's like, you know what? Let me just get five at five. What the hell? It'll make for a good example, worst case scenario. So if there's, I don't know, it's a big F, but let's say this stock catches on fire and we're just seeing the beginning of this move out because we had a fake out move higher, it came back in. Now it's taken off. Everybody who missed the first trade, like me, I'm hoping there's other, some other people out there. I know you said hope, but everybody that missed that trade has to put up or shut up, okay? So my thinking is maybe this thing could pop two or three points tomorrow, maybe, okay? And if it doesn't, then it becomes a pizza versus steak nights, okay? So I risk a whopping $25. Now let's say it does rally that three points or whatever, and goes one point in the money. Each option is worth $1, okay? So $1 times five, and then each one's 100, right? 100 shares. So that option position will be worth $500, $25. And I'm going to use the word bet. That's a $25 bet because that's what it is, okay? And I just figured it was worth it because I, I here's the, the mental masturbation I was going through too. It's like tomorrow, if this thing's up a buck or two, then those options are going to be really expensive. It's going to be really hard to get into those options. So today, pardon my French, I could just piss away a little bit of money and have this kind of S and G positions. Now, don't spend a lot of money on this type of stuff because most of the time you're just throwing your money away on something like this. But can it move three points tomorrow? It might. I mean, it could. Now, the other thing that I would do, and again, I just didn't want to pay up for them. And only, like I said, only ended up with five for an S&G type of trade. I think that if if I wasn't at a drawdown right now and the markets weren't so crazy, I probably would have tried to get a hundred or so off. And then what I would have done was put in a limit order to get my money back as quickly as possible. So put in a limit order for half and a double and then have 50 for a free roll type of position, okay? And if this thing goes two or three points in the money, I've got 50 options and you know, it's 10, 15 grand or whatever the case that is. That might be an exaggeration, but let me think about that. 5,000, yeah, you make 5,000 for every point, okay? So if it were a few points in the money, I know you could dream, right? For a $100 bet, better than poker the eye, right? And again, it's probably gonna expire worthless, but this is just kind of a good example of what could happen with options. So this option is not worth anything at expiration, right? As long as we're down here below 45. And tomorrow, watch them peg that price. <laughs> Which if I had 100 options, it would, would be fine because what I would do is I'd, I'd be unloading all the way up to 45 and then I keep 50 just, and see, just in case it broke through. So that's just an s and type of trade. One day till expiration out the money 100 percent fluff this option is worthless at expiration is it worth 25 dollars to me to control 500 shares of stock as we say in fargo you betcha now if i lose and everything fails miserably which it probably will i will lose 25 dollars. so it's a pizza versus steak night I guess joked earlier or a few weeks back or whatever it was, a few months back I joked. My wife's always like, how can we always have pizza on Friday nights? <laughs> can we have steak? Now again, can the stock move far enough by expiration to make buying the option worthwhile? It's really the main question you need to ask yourself. And if you're trying to establish options as a substitute for stock, like one of you guys brought up today, I will do this in an IRA or a qualified account where you can't short, 
you could buy options as a substitute for stock. So there's kind of a Goldilocks situation. Again, I'm okay with paying up a little bit for fluff, whereas other people are just, they're just adamantly, adamantly against it. But I like sleeping at night, okay? Um, you know, that fluff I paid $25. I'm not going to, believe me, I'm not going to care about that $25. I lost way more than that in other positions today. But what's a Goldilocks situation between paying for that that fluff versus paying up for the intrinsic, okay? So every point you go further in money is an extra $100 you got to put up. Cheaper options, again, allow you to sleep at night, but are more likely to expire worthless. More expensive in the money options costs more. So you're risking more from a money wise perspective, but or more likely to not go to zero before expiration. So if I'd have bought 40 options, strike price 40 in that MBLY, I'd be, I, it would cost me at least $3 plus the fluff, okay? So let's just say $400 total per contract. So I'd have $2,000 in that position and something better happen between now and the expiration tomorrow for that $2,000 to pay off as opposed to $25, okay? <laughs> Sweep that under the rug. You know, what's the fluff worth to you? By that I'm saying, what is sleeping at night, what is that worth to you, okay? And I'm okay, again, paying up a little bit with those in the money, with the at the money options, excuse me, or slightly in the money options. I don't go too far deep into the money unless the unless the the option prices are just ridiculous to where it's it's just some they want some ungodly number for the at the money option. But as you go deeper and deeper and deeper in the money, because you're risking more of your capital, it's like the premiums come off. The, the I'm sorry, the fluff comes off on that or extrinsic in the options world. Okay, any questions on that? Everybody still here? Uh, lately, I've been doing the intraday uh, trading experiments. I wasn't going to show this this week, but I, last minute, I just decided to put things together. I think there's a few little lessons in here I want to flesh out. One thing I was thinking about before I was going live is there's there's only so much time, right? Okay, and I'm doing two shows, and there's, I'm, I'm running an educational business, and then I have my own trading, and then life's happening all around me. And so on and so forth. It feel like it feels like there's just it's just uh, not I don't want to say spitting out of control, but just like there's just so much going on. It's like a blur, right? I didn't realize it was Thursday. I think until halfway through the day, I'm like, oh my god, it's Thursday. <laughs> you know, it's crazy. Anyway, one thing that I haven't had enough time to do, other than in my head, is do the forensics on these trades, and I want to begin to eventually share them with you. And it's one thing I started to put together earlier tonight, but ran out of time. For instance, I played some opening gap reversals in the banks a couple of days ago, and you would think I would have printed money. And instead, I just made a little money and not much at all. And part of that, I think, is because I'm I'm kind of trading scared just because conditions have been so poor lately. So I think there's some psychological lessons that I need to flesh out on that. And I really need to take more time and do the forensics, the postmortems on these trades. And and so it's one thing to me, hey, I made it, I lost money. That doesn't do you any good. Other than the fact that I'll show you when I make money and when I don't. And so let's just go through that real quick. So this day here, the market sold off and rallied. This was last Friday. Sold off and rallied. It just was kind of all over the place, even though it worked its way lower. So I lost $631. The next day, it gapped lower, took off, began to implode, tried to rally, and then sold off again. And somehow through all that mess, I was able to make 200 bucks. Yay! I would tell all my friends, right? Now, on this day here, kind of all over the place again. And this is what's kind of frustrating lately. It's like you get these gap moves, and then you get all these whipsaws, as opposed to the market like in a bear market, I'm sorry, a bull market, starting a little weak and then just rallying all day long. You just ride the trend all day long. Beautiful thing, okay? But we haven't had that lately. We had these big gaps, and then we have these market jerks around quite a bit. 
So that was a 626 loss. So you can see these numbers are no longer adding up like they did a while back. Now on this day here, gap lower, shot up, came back in, bounced around, bounced around, bounced around. Looked like it was gonna sell off. It'd be the mother of all rollovers, right? And then it took off again. Now, one thing that I that I do, and again, I wanna share you share with you some of the things that help keep me out of trouble. Although you can see I've been still getting in trouble a lot. But one of the things is I look at the percentage move for the day, high minus low. So I'm looking at this high here, and then this low here, and then in this case, it'd be this low here. And if that's less than 50% of the normal average true range, and I could see if I could dig that formula out for you, then I think twice about getting short the E-minis or long the E-minis or whatever the ETF might be. I'm looking at the ETFs too. So on that day, I lost $12. I think that was yesterday. And that actually felt like a victory. And I did make one mistake in there or a trade that just didn't work out. And, you know, whether or not it was really a mistake, I don't know. But it cost me about 300 bucks. So without that one trade, it actually would have been a pretty damn good day. And then today, we gap lower a little bit. We go straight up like it's going to just go straight up. It implodes like it's going to take out the bottom of its range. And then it finally takes off. It has a little bit of correction midday. It works its way higher. So you can see that type of day, I could make money. So the is it worth it? Yeah, it's worth it when you have a route. But you can see it's still in a drawdown here. And this is just the profits. And you can see it kind of went straight up. It was pretty good. And then now becoming the definition of insanity in here. So it's it's a, it's a fun little experiment. And for now, I think I'm going to stick with it. And it seems like whenever I quit something like this or ready to quit something like this, we have the mother of all trend days. And that's a market doing its job. Um, I'm just going to go through these really quick. Uh, you know, am I trying to impress y'all? Maybe. I got to be careful with that. Uh, the market is not a daily money making machine. I can print money on a route day. The secret is figuring out when you're in a route day. And I hate to say it because I say it every webinar, it seems like, but it's the intuition versus the intuition. And that's a Sakota ism. So, uh, and Sakota said that. Now, again, the focus is tough. Um, this is left over from a couple of weeks ago, but it seems like I'm missing some moves here and there. There's only so much of me to go around, so I've got to watch this. My argument for this a while back was the fact that I'm here now all day, almost every day, because I'm doing two shows a week, which is a lot. Then might as well do a little trading on, on that with the position trade, especially with the position trade where there's not a lot of position trades that are happening. Um, a little trading scared. Like I said, I should have made a little more money in those banks. I need to go look at that, but I didn't. And I need to sit on my hands more. The, the bottom line is making money, and this is a general statement too. That's one thing too, is like the, it could be the microcosm of, of the longer term trend following. Making money isn't hard, keeping it is, okay? So those big days, and if you go way back in time, the, the five figure days, five figures, or at least four figure days, they've, they have been five figure days, but four figure days at least are worth it, and the market's in a route, and you just make money but then you give it up in between when you're getting chewed up by trying to just get greedy and trade all the markets all the time. So is it worth it? If I let the market come to be, yes. The stress has been mental and physical as I've been preaching. I think we're only wired for so many decisions. And lately the wife has been a little crotchety with me because she'll ask me something, you know, what do you want for dinner? I don't care. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, I'm out of decisions. It doesn't matter, okay? Do you want to walk two miles today or three? I don't care. <laughs> Whatever you want to do. And she's like, oh, she's just making decisions. So I need to just start making decisions again, I guess. Save a few of those decisions I'm using during the day. 
Uh, potential to put yourself in a state state of regret. Step on the gas. Something I did a while back. Don't step on the gas just because you had a good run, and that's part of this. That started part of this drawdown. Saying yes to something as I preach means saying no to something else. And again, you got to watch it because you start getting sucked into those flickering ticks, as Todd Harris calls them. And again, you know, it's some really good fractal learning, and it's really drawn me out quite a bit. Although it's expensive lately. But as far as my writing, when it comes to psychology, because I'm going through all these cycles more and more. Now, if you, I have a client base that, I have some clients that have been with me forever through thick and thin, and I love you guys. And uh, I got a really nice letter from one of you today, which I, I might post next week. And uh, you just re up for a year and it's like, you know, hey, I appreciate it. I know things have been great lately. He says, well, I have a, I have a good memory. I, I remember when things were good, so. But anyway, it, it's it's going through all those cycles and, and, and being able to to go through that. But if, if you're just coming back to me, as a lot of my clients do, they come they they come to me for a little while, then they go off, and sometimes they'll chase rainbows, and then they come back and say, "Okay, Dave, let's just do the TFM stuff. I get it now." Some of them are a little surprised to see that I'm doing this intraday stuff, and I've always done a little bit over time, such as the ogre trading and all. And now it's just kind of a little bit of an experiment I'm doing to see how it's all going to shake out. But the bottom line is less would be more. If I could just figure out how to trade less and less and less and less, I have some end-of-day stuff that I'm working on where you basically, the last five minutes of the day, I have an alarm that goes off five minutes before the close. You actually look at the play, those moves going into the close, and I call it the race to the finish. Now, the race to the finish doesn't happen every day, but every now and then you could see it just happening. You can kind of feel it where the market just goes straight up or straight down. And there's been days where I grind it out all day, make a little, lose a little, whatever, and all my money is made in the last five minutes. So maybe that's something to think about too. So I'm trying to flesh all those out. And believe me, over time, I plan on uh, talking more and more about it and showing you what I'm doing, especially once it begins to work. Like I said last week, it's nice when you're you're trading, your position trading, and you are doing the, the intraday trading and you make a lot of money in intraday trade. Let's say you're drawing down on your position trades, but you make a lot of money in intraday trades and it evens out. And that smooths out your longer term equity curve. And the real money is in the longer term trading, believe me. Unfortunately, there are times where it adds insult to injury. Brian just stated the obvious. And yeah, he's right. It looks like you're trading in a sideways market. What a revelation. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why I'm thinking like, well, why not just wait for that VIX to get stretched one way or the other? And here's the tricky part lately, too. There's four main ETFs I watch, the biotech, the SOX, the crude or the uh, the Gus Drip and JDA JDAS. Now, the commodities, I kind of go a little lighter on those just because they could be a little crazy. But in some of this huge chop we've been dealing with, this mess, they have there have been one or two of those markets that just really, really take off. And I haven't caught them all, believe me. And in some cases, I'm trying to catch everything, and that one market will take off, but then it, it's not worth it because of the rest. So there's something else that needs to be fleshed out. But yeah, absolutely. I agree with you on that. A lot of day traders only trade in the morning. Is there any evidence of that? Is it better? You know, I don't I don't know. It depends on what you're doing. I think if you're trying to trade reversals or something, that might be worthwhile. But I've had positions over the years where they'll trigger late in the day and 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 do really well. Sometimes the market will chop around all morning. But yeah, ideally if you could figure out a time frame to trade and then go about your life, that'd be great. All right, George took off TQQQ today. Stop at break even. Good for you, George. The only thing bad about holding those leveraged ETFs is you're going to deal with a bit of a, um, for lack of a better word, especially on the short side, of course, a decay effect. So let's uh, shift gears here. 
And I'll probably get through crypto pretty quick tonight. Let's see if we can do this real quick. Okay. Any questions about anything so far? Now, the crypto, like I said, it's just been all over the place. It's been really crazy. And let's see, it might have just rolled over, so we don't have any big moves just yet. But sometimes, as I've said before, you can just buy the ones that are going up. And now is, is really not that time. Let's take a look at Bitcoin real quick. Here's something that I was short that I covered. If you could see that a little bit of a rally and I'm really not trying to hold positions long, too long on the short side. As I said, on nausea, when the market is running, you could just buy the, the ones that are up the most for the most part with a few caveats, which if you go in and watch prior shows, I talk about those things. Let's take a look at the big ones, unless there's some that you guys want to look at. Just let me know if, this, if you want to look at some pairs. We'll take a look at Bitcoin. We'll take a look at Ethereum, too, while we're at it. But this is the craziness in these in the cryptos, okay? They're just absolutely melting down. And then now, all of a sudden, Bitcoin's going straight back up. So I wouldn't rush out and buy Bitcoin now. But it does look like, at least for now, it's headed higher. And as I've said, at nauseam. One thing that's a little disappointing is I was hoping, I know when you have a hope in markets, you, you find out, right? You F around, you find out. <laughs> but I was hoping that Bitcoin would trade, what's, what am I trying to say? Not be so positive correlated to the S&P 500. As I've shown before, a lot of times you can put one market under the other and they look like the same market. So it's kind of a risk on, risk off type of market. The risk on, risk off in stocks is the same exact thing in crypto. I was kind of hoping that crypto could go up in spite of stocks. That's what I'm trying to say. But uh, obviously it's not always the case. And maybe rarely that's the case. All right, any questions on crypto? So we'll just keep it brief this week. Um, oh, by the way, by accident, I just clicked on this. This is Ethereum versus Bitcoin, so you can see Bitcoin is kicking Ethereum's ass right now, okay? Let's just take a look at Ethereum by itself. You can see, actually, it doesn't look that bad. It looks a lot like Bitcoin, but relative to Bitcoin, Bitcoin is much stronger, okay? Just for what it's worth. The bank scare broke that correlation real quick. Yeah, but it's interesting because that bank scare... Wasn't there a big crypto impact? I don't want to confuse the issue with facts. And maybe we did see a little bit of that in the bank scare. But it's fascinating that that Bitcoin finally did behave like a flight to safety type of market, which I was hoping. I know hope is a word again. But yeah, good point, Jeff. Maybe there, maybe you're onto something there. But I thought that uh, there was a huge exposure. Maybe there was a dollar coin or something. Those tethers scare the hell out of me, by the way. But that's a conversation for another day. All right, shift the gears. Any going once, going twice. All right, let's hop over to the overall market. Okay. Let's take a look at the P's. S&P 500, decent day today, but as usual, follow through will be key. This actually puts us back above the 200 day moving average. We did have a golden cross. I wouldn't get too excited about the golden crosses as I've been preaching. One thing you should watch, if you have like a death cross, Watch for the magnitude of what happens below that death cross, not signal to signal. Signal to signal, longer term, doesn't test out. I think, who was it? Um, somebody did some testing on it, and they told me it was like um, Rob Hanna. 
I think it's like a 4% edge. It's a very minor edge. But with any trend indicator, look for the magnitude. Like here's a golden cross here. Look at the magnitude of what happens as opposed to the signal to signal. Now, in this case, even though you got a golden cross, the market was headed down when you got that. So don't get too excited about that in and of itself. But we are back above the 200 a in the P's. Take a look at bonds. Bonds kind of stalled out at the top of their range, as you can see, which was also right around the 200A moving average, thereabouts, how do it know, like the thermos, keeping the hot things hot and the cold things cold, how do it know? A lot of technicals often come together at the same point. This isn't a perfect example, but you'll see a lot of times, like this one right here, for instance, that's a, that's a perfect example of what I'm trying to say. Notice that the 200 was right at this prior peak, okay? A lot of times technicals, again, come together at the same point. So bonds are kind of stuck in a range. You could argue that longer term, they still look like the big blue arrow is pointing lower. Let's take a look at the weekly real quick for S and G's. Yeah, on a weekly basis, still pointing lower. We'd have to get above this little consolidation in here. Take a look at NASDAQ. NASDAQ 2.5% today, better than poke in the eye, huh? Back above the 200 and back above the 50. And we also have a golden cross. Let's not get too excited there. But again, with any trend indicator, as I just said, pay attention to what happens after you get the signal, okay? And see if other trend, if the trend develops, okay? And then as Baleo and Guyard said, bad things tend to happen below 200-day moving average. So be cautious as long as you're below 200. I wouldn't use that as timing in and of itself. Use some other stuff too, like the TFM 10% system. Russell 2000, decent day today, but it, it has imploded as of late. And it's making all these little multiple bottoms or complex head and shoulders, if you like. It's got a couple of heads down here, and now it's two or three shoulders. I would never trade specifically or directly off of bigger picture technical analysis, but I will use it, especially if I have a setup. If I have a setup, I'll use it as kind of like a backstop or or rephrase that as to kind of have put a little wind in my sails when a bigger picture pattern is working behind me. GBTC, I find interesting. GBTC is a proxy for Bitcoin. And I don't want to confuse the issue with facts, but they are trying to get an ETF. And a couple of weeks ago, they made, or a week ago, they made some convincing arguments, allegedly, on why they should be an ETF. Now, right now, I don't know what it is today, but I know that I think about a week or so ago, it was about a 40 to 45% discount to Bitcoin. So if tomorrow this thing traded exactly where Bitcoin was, or is, I should say, then it would be 40% higher. Now, I wouldn't buy it just off of that, but I do find it kind of interesting. So if we do get setups in this and it's still at a 40% discount, then maybe that could help. Keep in mind though, there's a reason why it's at a discount because people don't believe they're going to become an ETF. And an asset in control, an asset that's in control by someone else is always, or usually I should say, this did have a premium at times, but usually worth less because humans can muck things up, right? Maybe their keys can get stolen or whatever. Let's take a look at a couple of sectors real quick. Energies have kind of melted down in here. It's a bit of a bummer. One thing I was mentioning to the service peeps tonight, my clients, is that it could be a little counterintuitive, but sometimes stronger areas will begin to tumble two ways. One, let's say the market resumed that little slide we had not that long ago. Well, the stronger areas could be a source of funds. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. And on the more bizarre, standpoint let's say the market does begin to rally well they could the stronger areas can be a source of funds because people sell the stronger areas to buy the areas that are at lower levels that are just rounding the corner metals and mining pretty big slide as of late i wouldn't get too excited about the metals based on that slide banks obviously the elephant in the room What's interesting is we did take out these prior little lows in here. So everybody in the world probably thought we were going back down to here. And we still might. But 
the fact that we bounced a little bit faked out quite a few people. We're just going to have to see how it shakes out. But do pay attention to these uh, today's low. Should I get hit by a beer truck? Financials getting dragged out a little bit with the banks, as you would imagine, below the 200 and the 50. Drugs have been kind of imploding as of late. They did find a little support at the 200, but there's no reason for me to get excited about a chart that looks like that over what three month period is headed lower. Biotech had a little bounce today, but it's kind of all over the place. And for the most part, it's headed lower. It is back above the 200, but let's not get too excited about that. Let me just wrap it up with the semis real quick. I like when the semis head higher. I think it's a big, I think it's important for the semis to go up to confirm the what's going on in the overall market when the overall market is headed higher too. As opposed, I know some people watch the transports, Dow Theory looks at transports, but I like to look at the semiconductors. And the semiconductors have done pretty well. You've got nice Landry light above that 50 simple. We came down, we gave it a little bit of a kiss. And now we're not too far from these multi-month highs. And that's, I made a little bit of money in SOX sale today. That really helped out quite a bit on that intraday equity thing. All right, let's open up for individual stocks. If you have any ones, I know we talk about them all day at Facebook. If there's something you want me to pull up, let me know. Going once, going twice. Uh, DHT, there you go. All right, Brian, DHT. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Let's see if we can pick it apart a little bit. Yeah, there's been a few of these. This is uh, an energy stock. There were a couple of shippers on, on the list. At first glance, it looks pretty good. As I back the chart out a little bit, it's an energy stock. So yeah, it could be a little wide and loose. So I'm not gonna get too excited about that. We did kind of pull back to this prior little peak in here. Energies aren't really doing fantastic right now. So I've got a problem with that, okay? And then the next thing is, if you look at the net net price movement and a couple other things, so again, at first glance, it looks fantastic, okay? After you kind of pick it apart a little bit, you can see it took off and then it came all the way back in. Now, as I've said, ad nauseum, somebody quit the service and they they told me in, in a constructive criticism kind of way that I'm too selective. I'm too, I'm looking for too much perfection in my setups. Well, last year and so far this year is a market where you need to be super selective and be a bit of a perfectionist. So number one, it's energy, so I've got a problem with that. Number two, it's retrace 100% of its retrace. Number three, which is a little bit more difficult to explain, but it, it has been super strong compared to everything else, so it could be a source of funds. Now, if we're in a rip and bull market, then by all means, go after stuff that's going straight up, okay? FSLR, it's gonna be a solar stock. FSLR, first solar, right? Yeah, this one looks okay. Um, again, you know, relative performance pretty strong. There's always a danger of it becoming a source of funds. I, I'm not a huge fan when a market just kind of melts up like this in one or two bars. So you got this one big bar here with the gap, and then this one bar here. So I hear you. I'm going to say good eye. This is the first pullback after base breakout. Maybe slightly more pullback. It might be worth a shot. But at this juncture, I just think it would be kind of dangerous. But it, I'm going to give you a not bad on that one on a slightly deeper pullback. So just shy of a high five. RG, nope, or RGB. Or RGB, Red Robin. Okay. All right. Uh, so I'm going to scratch this one. You've got a mountain of overhead resistance to overcome here. Okay. So always look for that. You know, like I've been saying, the stock picking, as one client said, he was talking about trading in general, is, is caught, not taught. But from now on, and I know there was somebody else in the group uh, was looking at a lot of stocks with a lot of overhead supply. From now on, Brian, just give me those that don't have the overhead supply. ALGM is trending and it looks okay, okay? So we did clear this prior peak in here. It's a relatively new issue. It's been out for a few years. I'm gonna give that one an okay. Um, it has a little bit of a double top knockout to it. It's not currently set up. And the other thing you're gonna have to watch now is now it's trading a little sideways in here. 
but I hear you. It's kind of a this knockout move could have been a little bit bigger, but I'll give you a not bad on that, but no longer set up. If you're long, then uh, follow your plan. TMDX, TMDX. Yeah, this looks okay. Again, you know, kind of a super strong source of funds. And as I begin to pick it up, pick it apart, notice that 90% of the gains were that just one big day. And then it already retraced nearly 100% all the way back to its base breakout. So I would toss it out based on that. One thing I think you have to be careful about, and I was thinking about this earlier today, is and I'm kind of seeing it in the group a little bit. It's like everybody's so anxious to trade that you're not, the setups aren't, you're not looking for the perfection as much in the setups. This one's okay. It took out this little peak here. This was, I, I give this one a not bad. It was it was decent, okay, but it's already taken out this little peak. So it's 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 kind of already rallying out of the pullback on that one. But yeah, put that in your watch list for sure. All right, Jeff is asking about DTC. DTC. And he says a little more pullback volume may be an issue. Volume looks okay. It's over half a million, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. Yeah, this might this might be worthwhile because you got an IPO that failed miserably. Okay. Notice the buy at B. What is the first rule of buy at B? Don't talk about buy at B. No. Uh first rule of buy at B is don't buy anything if the day one high is set on day one and it does not close above that high. That stupid little rule, it looks like I've already drawn it in here. That stupid little rule would have stopped you from losing 90% of your money trying to trade this IPO. Um, I've been watching this one. I like it. I do. Um, I prefer if this thrust higher was was over more bars as opposed to just a couple, a bit of a melt up. Sometimes they melt up and they come right back in. For instance, look what it did back here. It kind of melted up, then it came right back in. But I think it's worth watching. So I would definitely put that on your watch list. And let's see what happens when it pulls back a little bit, okay? So, Jeff, I like the way you think. Reminds me of a joke I can't tell. <laughs> if we ever get together for beers, as we threaten a few times, we'll, uh, I might let go of a few Cajun jokes. Okay, this is a relatively new issue, so that it's got that going for it. Um, it has worked its way higher. It's, it's a little counterintuitive, but, again, we've kind of just had this one wide, wide range bar higher. It needs a little more pullback. Let's let's reevaluate this one. Let's say if it gets pulls back to about 18, I'm gonna give that one a strong maybe. Okay, I really can't pick it apart too much. You got a little trading to get back through here, but that's that was a long time ago. So I might be willing to pass on that. But yeah, um keep that on your watch list for sure. EFT. No, okay. Sam, a couple of problems here. First of all, here's your peak. You looking to short this or go long? I guess that's the first question I should ask. But if you're trading the pullback, then above this peak, oh, short it. Okay, he wants to short it. On the short side, and maybe it's too late for this, I prefer stocks coming off of like all-time highs or multi-year highs. So uh, I'm glad to hear you short, not long. Um, it's not bad on a short, but you also have, you got a lot of support right here. So I would pass. I, You know, if I had, this support was further down and this stock was higher up, I'd be all over that, and I agree with you. But um, I would pass on that one. All right, any more? Nearly out of time. As usual, I want to thank everybody for watching. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Anything unanswered? If you're not in the Facebook group, davelander.com slash contact. Thanks, Dave. I don't just – I don't think the service updated. All right, thanks, John. I'll. Uh, it seems like a week of charts day. I always have that issue, so I'll uh, I'll take care of that. I appreciate the update. If uh, I think everybody here is in Facebook, so we'll talk tomorrow. If um, if you're not or you're watching on YouTube, have a great weekend. Thanks for the option stuff. You're welcome. Oh, yeah, lots of uh, you guys are super nice. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right, everybody have a great weekend. If we don't talk again between now and then, and may the trend be with you. Thank you so much.